fifth session of the series, When Did the Christians Replace Israel? We will continue to trace the history of replacement theology. This false doctrine is an attempt to replace the chosen people of the Most High. The Almighty made an everlasting covenant with our ancestors and sealed it with a promise and an oath. Our covenant is everlasting. Our people cannot be erased. As we continue to fill in the gaps about our history, we will read through some of the writings and quotes of the so-called early church fathers. They are credited with documenting and writing the Gentile church history. By examining their historical writings, we will see how the called out assembly that was made up of Israelites transformed into what is known today as Christianity, a religion founded by the Romans. So I will pick up where we left off last time. I'm using the writings of Eusebius and some of the other Gentile church fathers to help us connect the dots about what happened after the death of the Israelite leaders. What you're going to see is that in a relatively short period of time, the Gentile converts took control of the sacred scriptures and began boasting of their superiority over Israel. They believed themselves to be the new Israel of God. And heretics began changing the doctrine and teaching it in a way that would make it more appealing to pagan Rome. So what I hope to bring out in this session is that there was a clear distinction between the called out assembly of believers and the Gentile church. All right, so this says, Eusebius refers to the martyrdom and the accession of justice to the 10th year of Trajan. This leaves 13 bishops to be inserted between 107 and 135 AD, which is to say the least very suspicious. The true explanation appears to be that after the death of Simon, the last prominent relative of Christ, the presbyters took the lead and that they were afterward made by tradition into successive monarchical bishops. It goes on to say, the fact is that the episcopate is of Greek, not of Jewish origin. And in the strictly Jewish Christian churches of Palestine, no such person as a bishop can have existed. Only after the church, there came under the influence of the Gentile church and lost its prevailing Jewish character. Was it possible for a bishop in the general sense of the term to exist there? So it goes on to say the Jewish character of the Jerusalem congregation was very marked until the destruction of the city under Hadrian. If you remember from last time, a vacuum was created when they killed off a lot of the Israelite leaders and they forced our people out of the city. So it says, note that all but two of the 15 bishops have Jewish names, after which all circumcised Jews, Christians, as well as unbelievers were excluded and a heathen Christian congregation took its place. I'll read that again. A heathen Christian congregation took its place. So guys like Marcion, who hated the God of the Old Testament, started coming in and preaching their own doctrine, basically. And let me say here that I'm covering a lot of articles, journals, book passages, etc. as we go through this series. And there are times when I need to use the words as stated in the text to try to maintain the integrity of what's been written. Most of you already know the true name of the Most High and Messiah. 
and I would like to be able to insert the preferred name each time, but in some cases, I'm going to be reading what is written. So even for words like Jewish, we know that our people didn't call themselves that. But for ease of understanding, sometimes it's necessary to read it as is. We're mature people, and I believe that we can understand this. So getting back to Marcion, so I'm going to share a bit more about him from this West Star Institute article, and I'm really honing in on him and his ideology so that you really understand the foundation of replacement theology. So this, the article entitled Marcion, Forgotten Father and Inventor of the New Testament, says Christianity owes a major debt to a man with no direct connection to Jesus of Nazareth or Paul of Tarsus, a man labeled a heretic by the forerunners of Orthodox Christianity. Marcion was a shipbuilder, possibly ship owner from Pontus, a small region in what is now northern Turkey. I know your bells are ringing now. We know little else about him except that at some point in his career he joined the Christian community in Rome only to find himself embroiled in debate with the leadership there. Ultimately, they were unable to resolve their differences and the Marcionite community broke from other Jesus followers of that era. So who are they today? Let's go on. It is unknown how separate the communities were in practice, but in some parts of the ancient world, Marcionites were called Christians, while groups with closer ties to Judaism were called Nazarenes. It goes on to say, at the early Christianity Heritage or Heresies Conference in Santa Rosa, California, Bedoun spoke about the important role Marcion played in shaping Christian identity. This begins with the relationship between Gentiles and Jews in the Roman Empire. A good contemporary analogy is the interest some modern white Americans have in Native American religion and culture, he said. A similar thing was going on with Gentile fans of Judaism in the ancient world. They wanted to take on foreign spirituality and practices. However, Jews rebelled multiple times against the Roman Empire in the second century and Gentile Christian groups fled association with them. So they basically left them high and dry. You would think they would have been trying to fight alongside them, right? I hope this is opening your eyes to see what was really happening during that time. Let's go on. It says, we tend to assume the version of Christianity we see today as inevitable, but actually there were many possible ways for Christianity to develop. Christianity may never have become a religion with a set of scriptures at all. Christians may have continued to interpret and reinterpret Hebrew scriptures, rely on oral storytelling, and consider themselves, it has Jewish, but of course we know they didn't call themselves that by that name then. But it says the very attitude of Marcionites setting themselves apart from the, I'm going to say Hebrews, led them to declare a New Testament. And that has made all the difference. So it goes on to talk about this New Testament that was published by Marcion, which was basically a collection of Paul's letters. And it says that Marcion is our first witness to six of the 10 letters now considered to be authentic by modern biblical scholars. So of course you know that the Roman Catholic Church basically authorized itself to determine what would be considered authentic and what 
was not authentic. So they made that determination. And hopefully you now see why we ended up with a Europeanized version of a religion that was created by the Roman Catholic Church. No matter how you try to slice it, Christianity is a religion that was created by the Romans. So it goes on to say biblical scholars came to the conclusion that only some letters attributed to Paul are authentic. Most exclude 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, for example. The evidence from Marcion supports this finding. The inclusion of Paul's letters in the New Testament was by no means certain. Rather, Marcion's choice to include the letters succeeded in pushing other communities to do the same thing when they came up with competing canons of scripture, although it took his competitors 200 years to establish the canon now found in Bibles today. So the author is saying what Marcion did and what the New Testament became are directly related. He directly affected the form and content of the New Testament. What is scripture and what is canon? These are not necessarily the same thing. When you call something scripture, what you simply mean is it's some kind of writing that is taken by somebody as holy and authoritative, somehow sacred. Now, different religions, some religions don't have what we would normally think of as scripture in Islam, Judaism, or Christianity. They might have lots and lots of holy writings, but they don't have a particular bounded body of writings that they call scripture. They have lots of uh, scripture. What makes something scripture, though, is that it's taken to be authoritative and holy by some particular community. Now, that, notice, that does not necessarily mean it's canonical, because Scripture in some religions refers to a bunch of stuff, but they don't have a set list of things that make something the canon. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all have basically canons. That is, the, it's the Quran for Islam, it's uh, the Hebrew Bible for Judaism, and it's the Hebrew Bible plus the New Testament, and we'll talk about some of the other writings too, for Christians. What does it mean to call something canon that makes it different from Scripture? What, what, by calling it canon, we're saying there's an actual list that a religious body adheres to with books that are either in or books that are not in. So scripture can refer to any kind of writing that a bunch of people consider holy or inspired or, some, or authoritative. But when you call something canon, you mean that there's a, a group of writing that has boundaries to it. And of course, it just comes from the Greek word canon, spelled with one N, not two. This Greek word means a list, it can mean a rod, a staff, it can mean a measuring rod, and so it comes to be a list that accounts as authoritative in uh, early Christianity. So that's what, um, that's what it means to call something canonical. When you talk about something like the Shakespeare canon, the canon of Shakespeare, or the canon of great Western literature, that's actually using the term in a bit of an expanded sense, uh, because we don't really consider Western literature to have an actual closed canon of authoritative text. In Christianity, though, it means the list of, of, of texts that are scripture and recognized as different from other things. We have to fir first also recognize that the early Christians, it seems like from the very early period, at least a lot of them, accepted Jewish scripture as their own. So, for example, when the Apostle Paul says, Scripture says, he's not talking about the New Testament, he's talking about Jewish scripture. So, Almost all the early Christians, they didn't know, most, the people writing the New Testament didn't know they were writing the New Testament. They just thought they were writing a gospel or a sermon or a letter or something like that. So when you see the term scripture in the, in the New Testament, all, all, every time except maybe one time, and we'll talk about this when we get to it, it refers to Jewish scripture that Christians accepted, followers of Jesus accepted as their own. Now I want to look at some excerpts from this book called St. Paul and the Anti-Nicene Church. It's an unwritten chapter of church history, and this was written in 1903. And I felt it was really important to include this because 
some of you have been reaching out to me and expressing your doubts about Paul, and I get it. I get it. I can certainly understand some of the concern, but here's where I am on this. Just based on everything that I've read, I believe that a lot of his writings were intentionally misinterpreted because some in the Gentile church needed to push a certain agenda. I feel like it was easier to manipulate things he said to make it seem like he was anti-law. Also, by them promoting more of Paul's writings, it made it appear like he was favored above the other apostles, and that was not the case. All right, so let's highlight some of this. It says, the early Christians were less disposed to feel the lack of what might be called a distinctively Christian literature, having its source and origin in definite Christian authority from the fact that there was already a literature at hand which supplied all their wants. It has been said that all religions tend to become religions of a book, so in the very beginning of the Christian history, the eyes of the Christians in every locality were directed with special reverence to the sacred scriptures of the Jewish church. The necessary limitation which their original Hebrew character would have placed upon their use by unlearned and ignorant men was broken through by the Greek translation of Alexandria and in their Greek form, which for many years was the only one familiar to any of the Christian writers, the Christian communities found their sacred literature. The method of interpretation, which was the popular one in use, not only among, among Palestinian and Alexandrian Jews, but also the one universally adopted by all heathen writers in their effort to readjust the ancient literature to the new movement in the spiritual progress of the imperial races was that of allegorism. So, interpreted, the Old Testament became a terrible weapon in the hands of the Christians against the Jews themselves. It was re-read and re-interpreted. It was no longer a Jewish, but a Christian book, and the Jews were denied all claim to it. The new and peculiar form in which it presented itself to the Christian was that the peculiar and purely Jewish element was now regarded as merely episodical so to speak, and the Christian element was regarded as the real contents of the book. Not all which the Old Testament contained was, it is true, regarded as Christian, but all Christian truth was contained in it. The Christians applied all the promises of the Old Testament to themselves as the true Israelites, as it had been the book to the Jew, so it became the book to the Christian. And all the writers of the first half of the second century, when they used the phrase SS or Holy SS, mean exclusively the Old Testament. The allegorical system of interpretation which enabled them to expel the Jew from his literary birthright and give a purely Christian interpretation to it, produced a more vehement attachment to it among heathen Christians than one would suppose. It goes on to say Christianity then being merely supplemental the natural movement of thought limited itself to the elaboration and definition of Judaism as already given in the Old Testament. 
while the exclusively Christian element seemed to play a very subordinate part. The supreme sacredness of their scriptures permitted no compromise and caused all other literature to sink into insignificance beside it. But there were others, perhaps excited through opposition, perhaps following a natural tendency and bent of their own minds, who saw in the two great religious forces, Judaism and Christianity, not identity and continuation, but opposition and revolution. And the necessity of a distinctive Christian literature was most clearly apprehended. But though these two extremes existed and affected the church both for good and evil by their exaggerations, the main body of Christians through the early part of this period regarded the Old Testament as the only sacred, sacred scriptures. Although in each locality there were, as we know, writings of Christian teachers read in the meetings for public worship of the Brotherhood. I'll go on to the next page. And it says, in the beginning of the second century, there was a recognized Christian literature with what we would now call canonical authority. And it says, it has been affirmed by the highest authority in our language on these writers that there is no evidence that either Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, any of these so-called early church fathers re recognized any canon of the New Testament. They were reading the Old Testament scripture. So think about what was happening during that era. The Israelite leaders were being replaced by these Gentile Christian converts who now had control of the sacred scriptures. And then things begin to change. Things are being tampered with. Like it's now more important to talk about the Lord's day as opposed to the Sabbath day. Insertions are being made like the word Easter when it previously said Paschal or Passover. So we have to also consider even the Hebrew names were changing to European names like Matthew, Mark, Peter, Paul, and of course, Jesus. And, and family, I have to say, for those who say that's why we shouldn't read the New Testament, I don't follow that line of reasoning because we know that the apostles lived. During their time, yes, they were reading the Old Testament scriptures because the events of their day was being written. But they lived. Messiah lived. So our task now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, by the way, is to expose the heresy and allow him to show us the lies that were added by the usurpers. We have to now rightly divide. It goes on, it says, in such a primitive state of things, one would not expect to find the epistles of St. Paul occupying a higher place than the evangelical narratives. And there is no evidence that they did. On the contrary, the material points in the other direction. In the Ignatian epistles, there is the fullest proof that the writer was acquainted with several of them, although he never directly quotes any one. I'll go on to the next page. It says, in the writings of Justin Martyr, we find memoirs of the apostles referred to as a class of writings having high authority. It is possible that these are the gospels which we now have or the documents from which these were formed. For we know that there was a large amount of evangelical literature of the most varied character. St. Luke refers to existing material in his day, which was the basis of his own work. Yet the authority which these writings possessed is peculiar and different from that of any other. There were two reasons which gave weight 
to these memoirs of the apostles. First, the apostles were the eye and ear witnesses of the things described and consequently were a court of last appeal as to matters of fact concerning the evangelical history. Secondly, their writings contain the recognized and undisputed words of our Lord. I'll go on because in this portion you'll see how some of the apocryphal books were removed or why it was removed, I should say. So it says the fact is that questions about the present canonical writings do not come into view with any prominence until we reach the Marcionite controversy. A complete and reliable list of writings which were in use in the Christian communities of the first half of the second century and the exact relation which they sustained to the common Christian life cannot now be fixed. There is evidence which goes to show that in addition to the writings with which we are familiar, many others were also held in great esteem. Marci Marcion had his peculiar gospel, as also Basilides and the later Valentinians. Some critics have even gone so far as to assert that each district each diocese and almost each school or group read a gospel which had become familiar to it. Each considered that it had the right to regard its gospel as the current and authoritative one. Marcion and his followers so acted and they were not the only ones. Out of this uncertainty, the church slowly emerged and the canon of the New Testament was built up. But as the subsequent history shows, it was by a process of sifting and selection and not simply of collection and addition. Now look at the next page. It says, the legal tendencies of the current religious interpretations made the Old Testament and the gospel practically identical in their teaching, although not in the details of their contents. Christianity was the new law, while Judaism was the old. Let's keep going. It says, oftentimes they used Old Testament expressions for New Testament thoughts. But as a general rule, it may be said that if they did not mean the strictly Jewish and legal thought, which was associated with the language, they were almost equally removed from the circle of ideas which appear in the Pauline epistles. The term new law as applied to the gospel in opposition to the Old Testament or Jewish law appears very early in the Christian literature of the second century. It says the old law was intended for the Jews and had no further application, but the new was an universal law intended for all mankind and opposed to the Jewish law. The opposition, however, was only in contents. The new revelation fell into the same category and had the same essential form and legal conception behind it that Justin failed to recognize the connection as well as the distinction between the old and the new economy and to comprehend the difference between the law and the gospel does not bear hard upon him, for it was the universal and, we may say, inevitable attitude of heathen Christianity. I'll drop down. It says the historical significance of the election of Israel was entirely without meaning to them. And while they converted the Old Testament into a Christian book, at the same time, they interpreted the gospel in terms of the law. Don't miss this very important point. 
It says the form of Christianity, which the great Catholic teachers, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement, and Origen reveal, is an essentially different one from that of the New Testament. The Catholic Church, as it issued from the mighty spiritual movement of the second century, bears in organization, doctrine, and moral ideal a characteristically different stamp from that of the messianic community of the apostolic age. So why was so much importance placed on the Pauline writings? Well, let's find out. It says an undoubted influence, however, was exerted upon the position of the Pauline literature and the development of the New Testament canon as a whole at one period retarding and at another advancing it by an authority which was originally of paramount importance that is catholic tradition as i said it was easier for them to manipulate the writings of paul so let's listen to this it says the gnostics since they were men for the most part of superior cultivation and learning adopted the methods used in both jewish and pagan schools and based their systems upon teachings which they claimed had been transmitted to them by tradition it was by this tradition they justified their position they claimed to have received it from different apostles and apostolic teachers and great stress was laid upon saint paul when they were confronted by the opposition between their view and the public teaching of the church they took refuge in the theory of a secret tradition by which they endeavored to defend themselves and also appealed to the epistles of saint paul so a great practice is to find two or three witnesses it should it should not be all of what paul said we should have corroborating scripture from other witnesses in other words it should line up with the whole counsel of the book and replacement theology can easily be debunked by just a few scriptures from the old testament I want to highlight a few things from this article from Learn Religions. It says Jewish versus Christian. It actually goes to the heart not only of the Christian understanding of the church, but also of the way in which Christians interpret scripture and salvation history. Unfortunately, in recent years, a great many misunderstandings of salvation history have developed and these have made it harder for people to understand how the church views herself and how she views her relations to the Jewish people. Honestly, you all, the early Christian leaders exemplify the attitude of Europeans for the most part. They can only be part of something if they own it. They have to be the stars of the show. For example, when our people thought Messiah was blonde hair and had blue eyes, a large percentage of us were okay with that. He didn't have to be a melanated man. We were thankful for his sacrifice and happy to know that we could be grafted in. Not so for Europeans. The very idea of Messiah being a black man is repulsive to many of them. For a few of them, they will accept olive color. And by that, we're talking green olive, not black olive. This this lie of white supremacy that they have been fed about white skin, a recessive gene, by the way, is their identity. And that's the truth. This is what is at the core of replacement theology. So the author goes on to say these misunderstandings 
of dispensationalism sees the old covenant that the Most High made with us, his people, and this new covenant that they see as being initiated by Messiah as completely separate. They are not. So it says, in the history of Christianity, dispensationalism is a very recent idea. First put forth in the 19th century, in the United States, however, it has taken on great prominence, especially in the past 30 years, being identified with certain fundamentalist and evangelical preachers. It says dispensationalist doctrine leads those who adopt it to see a stark break between Judaism and Christianity, or more correctly, between the old covenant and the new. But the church, not only Catholic and Orthodox, but mainstream Protestant communities has historically viewed the relationship between the old covenant and the new covenant very differently because it began when they tried to replace us. That's what this is all about. It's the confederation of those who wanted to cut us off from being a nation. And this started as soon as the Israelite leaders were killed and our people were scattered. So the author goes on to say that in the same way Israel, the chosen people, us, whose history is documented in the Old Testament, is a type of the church. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church notes, it says the word church, which is Latin, ecclesia, from the Greek, ekkalien, or to call out of, means a convocation or an assembly Ecclesia is used frequently in the Greek Old Testament for the assembly of the chosen people before Yah, above all, for their assembly on Mount Sinai where Israel received the law and was established by the Most High as his holy people. By calling itself church, the first community of Christian believers recognized itself as heir to that assembly. So it says, in the Christian understanding, going back to the New Testament, the church is the new people of God, the fulfillment of Israel, the extension of God's covenant with the chosen people of the Old Testament to all mankind. This attitude about us is not new family. The Roman Catholic Church, i.e. the Christian Church, wanted our vocation. They wanted the gifts and calling that was given to us. And the concept of a new covenant made that possible. This parable of Yeshua found in Matthew 13, 24 through 30, is the foretelling of what happened. Let's read this. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, 
I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So a false and corrupt church was planted alongside the real and the true. It has mimicked righteousness and presented itself to the world as the Israel of God, but it is profane and ungodly. It is now being revealed to be so in these last days. Its works has revealed it. So let's read this from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Messiah is speaking. And he says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. At this point, we have to ask, well, what is the will of the father? His laws, his statutes and his commandments. They reveal what the will of the father is. Messiah is the Torah reveal, the word made flesh. So, when you believe in him, you are believing the utterances of the Father. Let's go on. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Which religious group is known for practicing such things? Are Muslims, Buddhists, or other religious groups other than Catholics and Christians known for these things? No. So when Christianity says that the law has been done away with, it has set itself above the law that says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, it has set itself above the law about coveting what belongs to others. How do we know this? Because it was the Christian church that sanctioned all of these things during European colonization, manifest destiny, and the founding of this nation. It was the Christian church that created a slave Bible with large portions of scripture removed to ensure that the people this nation had enslaved would only have access to a slave master approved version of scripture. They denied them the full counsel of the creator. It was the Christian church that allowed laws to be written that said, even if a Negro becomes a Christian, he would not be considered fully human and his basic human rights could still be violated at will. Is it clear to you how he can say to those who have been known to cast out devils, prophesy and do wonderful works I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I hope you didn't miss the fact that he said, I never knew you. Let's read this from Isaiah 41, 8 through 10. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So is it possible for the Israelites to be the people he was speaking of when he said, I never knew you? Not based on this scripture and many other verses of scripture. 
We are told here that we are his servants. We have been chosen. But the replacement theology has made Israel insignificant, a people with no heritage, no identity, and no land. Do you see how this doctrine led to the enslavement and trafficking of our people around the world? We'll continue with that next time, family. Be sure to hit like, share, and join me next time. Shalom, everyone.